one. And... Hey guys, uh, welcome to Happy Hour with Raj. Uh, it's good to have you guys back. And this week I have the lovely, talented Karen Strassman here with us at Happy Hour with Raj. So cheers, Karen. Welcome to Happy Hour with Raj. Whatever you're drinking, we're not going to ask. We're not going to ask. <laughs> We let everybody have their drink privacy, basically. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you guys, I'm drinking Chardonnay today. So it's like a local. I try to pair a local wine with a, a good voice actor. Aww. <laughs> it's like, yeah, there you go. So, Chardonnay is nice and nice and light. It's not too right? heavy. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we were just, Karen and I were just talking before the stream show. We were talking about my cauliflower recipe. I've been posting recipes. <sighs> Um, that looks cooking. really good cauliflower it was cauliflower curry it had raisins in it um it was actually black beans uh <laughs> and black beans cauliflower and coconut right coconut. and and in coconut milk so just some written coconut milk <sighs> and uh, and onions so it's like you know my All my family do. yeah well we have we're south indian and so the south indian food is a lot of cauliflower in it and so i've been cooking like variations of south indian food trying to make it really kind of fit really well together with wine because i'm up here in wine country <laughs> so it's like and and stuff that's still got that really you know um curry flavorful curry mm. kind of taste to it and but but fits together with wine as well because it's if, if it's too pungent it doesn't fit together with wine so it kind of make it a little bit creamier feeling so it fits together it's almost like a mixture of french cuisine and an Indian cuisine together. I lived in Paris for a couple of years. You did too, you lived in France. Really? Right? Yeah, when, did you, so, when did you live in Paris? What years? I, I was there in 99 to 2001. We were there at the same time. Really? I was, I was there from um, uh, 1986 to 2002. Oh. No, 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 yeah, to 2002, I moved here. Wow. Okay. And what you're we there at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I was in Bastille. Bastille it's close uh, to St. Paul station. Yeah. I was, I was at uh, right near the Place Saint-Michel. Okay. So not far from Notre Dame. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, yeah. yeah. It was on a little, a little street called La Rue de Savoie, okay. where it had a store that you might know. It was called, it was a tea store. It was called the Mariage Frère tea store. And it was right Maybe. behind a big, a really fun farmer's market shopping street called La Rue Saint-André-des-Arts. That sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. Okay. And right, then, right near the boulevard, okay. the boulevard Saint-Michel Saint and, and um, the, um, which would go over the bridge to go on to Ile de la Cité and also to Notre Dame. So it's close to all of that. I have good memories and I have like mixed feelings too I, mean, I loved Paris and then I didn't love Paris and then I loved Paris and didn't love Paris it was like back in, there's so many good and, and and so many kind of crazy things about that city too you know back in the 90s as well it was it was actually like it was actually like um romantic but at the same time harsh yeah right it'd be like kind of harsh you'd get this beautiful romantic street. Be, yeah and the Parisians would be kind of harsh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And then I'd step in dog poop and I'd be like, why am I here? And then I'd go, oh my God. <laughs> and I came from Tokyo too. So it was such a, a contradiction. I mean, Tokyo was so different, you know, polite and clean. clean and so organized and tight. And Paris was like the opposite of that, you know, kind of wild and everything was all over the place. And so, so what were you doing in Paris anyway? What, what were I was going to ask you what you were doing. <laughs> um, I, I went there um, yeah. as a student oh, okay. um, to study French. Um, and I, I was studying psychology at Tufts University and I went for my okay. junior year abroad at 19, okay. age 19. And um, so I was just going to go there a year and study French. And, yeah. um, and I, I, um, when I was studying, I was studying in all these different schools and I was also studying theater because that's been my passion my whole entire life. Yeah. Um, much more than psychology. And uh, I saw I was studying, taking French classes in a theater, French theater classes. Okay. And in that theater, they had a little bulletin board and they were advertising, they were looking for an American student to do an apprenticeship or an internship okay. um, as a dialect coach. Oh. And it was like the studio in town that um, was sort of responsible for coaching actors to 
learn to act in English for the camera because there were all these co-productions that would come to town. Okay. Um, the, the, you know, co-productions from the United States, co-productions from Canada, where they'd want to shoot in English or sometimes in both languages. Mm -hmm. And so French actors, if they wanted to, you know, be cast in those, they had to have a certain level of proficiency in English right. and not just grammar, but acting in English, you know, and, and you know, accent wise. And okay. I learned to do that there with them with this apprenticeship and it was just a fluke but I was really really good at it and yeah, I was yeah. so good that they um, offered me a full-time job the following year as one of their main dialect coaches wow. and the following year I was slated to go back to Tufts and work get my psychology degree wow um, my okay. diploma my college diploma and my psychology degree nice. and, everything. and I had a choice between doing that or staying in beautiful Paris and working with actors and doing what I loved. Oh. <laughs> um, living in this the beautiful city with this, yeah. with a, I had gotten a bicycle by then. I was biking all over, you know, oh. one of those old fashioned yeah. bicycles from Holland yeah. that yeah. I take all over the city. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of, it was just, it was very unexpected, but it was a no brainer. And I yeah. said, let me think about this. Yes, I'll stay and take the job. So yeah. I took, I took the job and then that year while I was coaching classes at this yeah. place, they also sent me out to film sets and um, and TV sets to coach on the film and TV sets. And they sent me to like famous actors' homes to coach the famous actors in their homes right. and prepare them for films. And um, so it was just, a, it was magical. Um, yeah. And I was on a TV set, it was a co-production and the director said, oh, little Karen, she's so cute. We give her a role. So I got a, a little role, my first, you know, yeah. Role in a French TV series, right? Um, and uh, and then I got an agent there, right. and then I started getting voiceover work, and so when that in year French? passed, in, in French in, or in in English? actually in English, there's a, a community there. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of animation in English there because a lot of a lot of the animation they do they want to sell to an international market, yeah. so it's much easier to sell if they if they have it in the original product in English, because then, you know, more people understand it. So it's easier to sell to an international market, right. um, but video games as well. And also I, at that time, you know, that was the eighties right. and I was dubbing tons of films um, from French into English um, for, for airplanes, for all kinds of things. And I was dubbing, I was sort of the young, um, the young voice of all the French movie stars, all the French young movie right. stars. So Juliette, Juliette Binoche, um, yeah. like a lot of a lot of them are not known here, but are known there. And I even I was somebody reminded me of this the other day when um, French Kiss, the film with Meg Ryan and Kevin Klein, was made mm -hmm. um, about an American in Paris, and they dubbed it into French. Mm -hmm. They hired me to dub Meg Ryan's voice into French with an American accent. Donc, je jetais la voix de Meg Ryan, je parlais avec un accent américain. <laughs> an American accent, with uh -huh. a total American accent, too. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and yeah, so I just, I just got, I, be, I got work as a dialect coach. I started getting film and wow. TV work, lots of voiceover. And then, um, because it, would, it had always been my dream to go to film school, I um, had actually really wanted to go to Juilliard or Yale yeah. Um, or one of those big um, theater schools in America, but I didn't think I was good enough or pretty enough. Somebody told me that I wasn't pretty enough to be an actress. Oh my God, don't let them tell you that. Yeah, and and that, but they told me that I wasn't ugly enough or funny looking enough to be a character actress so that I would never make it. And I, I didn't know anybody in the theater or film business. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just something that I'd always, always loved and dreamed of doing my entire life, but mm -hmm. I didn't, and it wasn't like for lack of caring. It's just that I I was in Wash. I grew up in Washington D.C., which isn't really. A th I mean, they have really good theater there, but I just we didn't know anybody. My dad was an architect. My mother was a a, a, a psychologist, a therapist, and yeah. it was just they didn't know, and and they were scared because they wanted to make sure I made a living, and they were afraid like I'd go and just get lost in New York, you know. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> there wasn't. It wasn't. I don't blame anybody, but it was just kind of, I didn't believe in myself and I didn't have guidance or support um, from people who knew what to do. 
Right. Um, so I was in France and I thought, well, I'm doing all of this mm -hmm. and I should get more training. So I got into the French Royal Superior Academy of Dramatic Arts, which is wow. the best and biggest theater school in France, in Paris, right. where they actually pay the students to go there. Mm -hmm. And I studied, I studied Moliere and Racine and even Shakespeare in French. And I took horseback riding lessons in the, in the, one of the national parks and I took fencing and voice lessons and it was it was a dream um, and so I started doing a lot of theater there and every year passed and I just decided to stay another year and stay another year and I ended up you know really getting my French very fluent so I could act in French and right. um, and I ended up staying in France for 16 years. Wow. You know, it, I mean, I didn't have that experience in France, but I had a dream experience in Japan too. It was like the same thing. I it, one year turned into another year and ended up being like like nineteen years in Japan. You That's lived, Raj. Yeah. You lived nineteen years in Japan. Nineteen years I lived in Japan. Yeah. So you That's moved there when you were five. <laughs> So uh, I moved there after my undergrad and then I came back and did my graduate degree and then went back again and uh, ended up there for like you know, 19 years and I, I just fell in love with it and it was every year was like something cool and it was the same thing I kind of fell into the yeah. music industry and uh, doing a lot of session singing and finding friends and then finding work as a songwriter and then a performer and it just kind of you know one thing it just kept snowballing and every year there was another offer and and then I just ended up like you just loving it and staying you know and I and uh, and I I still love Japan I couldn't live there again but you know I spent like yeah same thing like you know a good portion of my life you know in Japan and so I get I get that but you've had like wow like like horseback riding and fencing I wasn't doing that it was um, <laughs> well you were you were working with <laughs> Japanese musicians and yeah so you did you how long did it take you to learn to speak Japanese because that language just seems very daunting to me it's a really difficult language it's a good diff, it's an easy language to get a hold of at first but it's difficult to get get um, conversational with it yeah uh, but you know like French or other languages it's like you know it, it, there's a root of, of you know where you can kind of see where it's going and yeah but Japanese there's it's just it's just a complete different way of thinking you know so it took me I think it was about five years before I was like I took I went to school for a few years but I just wasn't able to like get a hold of it the way I wanted to it took about five years before I was like comfortable like not you know it's like when you learn another language you're kind of always a little slightly stressed out because you're worried about miss misspeaking or misunderstanding you're always like it, it takes you know it's hard work to keep up with people you know and uh, but Japanese is a interesting language and they love France they're just obsessed with France and Japan. It's amazing. The Japanese, especially in anime, if you look at a lot of anime, the fashion, a lot in a lot of anime and the yeah. very, very French influence the Japanese, very much so. It's really incredible. There's a lot of um, French, like they use a lot of French names in anime. Yeah. And I've actually been at, there's a lot of anime that I've been asked to do a French accent for. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. That doesn't surprise yeah. me. Yeah. They, yeah, it, it's interesting because they, you know, they they take in a lot of different cultures. And I went there so because I have a Japanese girlfriend who was going to go there to study in in Paris. And so I I went, you know, with with her and and you know I stayed for a while and ended up coming back to Japan. But um, it was just you know uh, there were so many Japanese, especially in the '90s when Japan's economy was booming. A lot of Japanese wanted to go live abroad. And so many of them wanted to go to France and live in France, right? It was a dream for the Japanese to go live in France or live in Paris or Vienna or London. And so there were a lot of students coming, leaving Japan, going to Europe to study. And, um, and so the, you know, the 90s in, in Paris were fun. Oh, was, the 90s was, in Paris were so fun. <laughs> so fun. I just remember parties all the time, just constantly parties, you know? Like, yeah. I remember running into Johnny Depp at the Buddha bar um, really? I think, yeah, I remember Sophie Marceau and Donny Johnny Depp were at the Buddha Bar in Paris. I remember walking in there one night, and my friends were saying, "Hey, that's it's Johnny Depp," and I was like, "No, it can't be," because I kept getting closer, and he kept getting shorter. And I was thinking, like, "How tall is he?" And he's actually quite small. He's a very small guy, and I, because I was pictured as this kind of you know tall, <laughs> kind of tall dude, but he was very very small. Actually, it was kind of shocking. Him and Sophie Marceau—they're quite small people. Uh -huh. And yeah. his ex-wife, um, Vanessa Paradis, she, she's yeah. small. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I um I voiced I voiced her in a movie as well. 
I think mm-hmm. I voiced Sophie Marceau. I think I voiced Vanessa yeah. Paradis in English. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's yeah. So fun. And so, but you speak Japanese fluently now, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, after, you know, years there of, of um, dealing with, you know, the every day in day out with Japanese, you, you know, you can't sort of, can't help but get fluent with it. And I was pretty persistent. So, yeah. And I, you know, I love the culture there. I love the the discipline that they have. Yeah. Yeah. And the focus that they have and how they're able to mix different cultures together and take the best of them and and utilize them in their own culture like you know a lot they love a lot of european culture and they really bring it into their own culture and their sense of fashion and food and taste and and um, yeah it's very it's it's really an, it's an interesting culture for sure definitely i've, I've never been there and i've always wanted oh, to go really? I've, I've almost gone there for motion capture like twice okay like i've almost gotten hired and shipped over to do motion capture yeah um, and then for one reason or another it it didn't work out either i was booked on something else or um i was i was the second choice and they sent the first choice or whatever but i I remember like thinking i'd I'd really especially because i've been since i've you know been back in this country and you know doing so much anime and japanese product i've just worked with so many japanese clients and kind of been steeped in the culture in that way Mm -hmm. and um and i'd love to just to be there and experience all the things that i've experience from afar you know well how did you get involved in japanese anime because you're, you're you're really involved in like japanese games and anime and I, so how did i i just assumed that you'd lived there and you'd gotten involved with this but oh that's really interesting because i thought for some reason you'd spend some time so how did you end up getting involved in all of this how did it sort of happen i might have done a little bit when i was doing voiceover in france but it wasn't yeah. they they weren't dubbing much um I was dubbing a lot of things, a lot of cartoons into English. And I was in this mm-hmm. very small group of maybe 10, then maybe 10 to 30 actors, who, yeah. Americans or expats in, in France who yeah. were doing all of the voiceover and dubbing in English in Paris. Okay. They used to call me the voiceover princess. And um, <laughs> several, of, several yeah. of my dear friends there were actually sad that I left but on another hand they were kind of happy because they got a lot more work when I left (laughs) Um, but so but most of the anime that went to France they just dubbed right into French and they would you know dub it into English in America so I was I did some anime Mm -hmm. um, and my French was good enough so that I could act in tv and film but I wasn't dubbing as much into French because they you know the French wanted to take advantage of my English commodity there yeah yeah yeah. Um, so So um, I started, I dove into it big time when I moved back to this country. I moved Mm -hmm. back. um, I I always kind of knew it was my dream to do on camera and TV, TV and film in, in, in Los Angeles and Hollywood, you know, and ever since I was a little girl, that's always been my dream is to do uh, TV and film um, in this, you know, in this business <laughs> and yeah um so i came back yeah to to the united states to do that here mm-hmm. and but i also i but voiceover is also you know it's my home as well yeah. you know it's yeah. and and it's always always been my bread and butter as well you know when i'm not making money from movies or tv i'm making money from voiceover right um right and and then i coach on the side when i have time because i love it yeah um but uh, I moved back to this country and I was like, okay, I need to get a day job, you yeah. know, while I'm meeting all the casting directors and my yeah. day job was voiceover. And so I immediately signed up, you know, found a, got into a, an agency because I just have, you know, I had 16 years of professional experience behind me. I was very successful over there. Yeah. And then, um, and then I started working with people and people who were directing stuff and directing anime and, mm-hmm. Um, there are a couple people who just, you know, you'd work with one person, they connect you to another. I met um, Mona Marshall and Doug Stone at a at a gathering, and they were very mm-hmm. generous with me. That says they sound like you're very talented. You seem like a very lovely person. Let me give you a few contacts, and they did. And I followed up with those contacts, and those people, you know, heard my demo and felt that it was very solid. And so they would start to hire me for smaller anime roles, and then little by little, I was 
you know, within the new year, I was doing leads in anime. Um, my first, my first or second anime in um, in this country was Haibane Renmei. Okay. Which is a beautiful artistic thing that I did for Jonathan Klein at New Generation. And Jonathan Klein hired me a lot after that. And there was one that Lex Lang directed me and that I did very, I think even maybe before that, mm -hmm. um, called Babylon something. Okay. And, and, and so I just, I started working for New Gen. I started working for Bang Zoom right away. Um, I started working for Cup of Tea Productions. I started working for, um, um, uh, there's a couple that aren't, that aren't, um, are closed now, but all the, all the big anime studios in town, I just got introduced to them and they were very open to, to hiring me. And then I guess, you know, because I've been doing it for, I was already doing it for so long. I was, I knew what I was doing and, yeah. you know, I was very good, not, not because I was that extraordinary, but just because, you know, when you do, you do something for 15 yeah. years, you get decent yeah. at it. And so, yeah. um, and I was a young ingenue voice at the time and yeah. they were needed. And so I just dove right in to the anime and, and video game scene here. Um, wow. You know, again, I just been doing it. Yeah. Since I was a teenager and yeah. knew what I was doing and, um so that's how it happened and so uh, uh, and then that's that just totally makes sense that's it's amazing a transition but i'm kind of curious what's the difference between the voice acting world and in in france as opposed to la because in in japan the voice even the voice world the, world, the singing world you don't really audition you just sort of they just call you for the part i don't know if it's like that in france but you don't audition in japan really they just sort of you know you they call you if they want you and that's it you know yeah Pretty much, you know, there's not a lot of this auditioning stuff that goes on here. It's, I'm just curious, in France, was there a lot of audition going on before the gigs? I auditioned for, I usually auditioned for everything. Really? Okay. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. I mean, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't, but it was, it was different though. It wasn't like here when I auditioned for, when I submitted auditions to my agency, I mean, they go in lumped in with, you know, the clients will get a hundred or more auditions. Like when yeah. I, I, I'm also, you know, I'm also directing stuff now and I'm also yeah. working as a casting director as well. And when I cast, you know, I, I have to really limit the amount of submissions agencies will send me because otherwise I can easily get 200 to 500 auditions that I have to listen to. Can you, can know? you do you mind and, talking? And when I was in France, when I was auditioning, yeah. I was auditioning against maybe 10 other people. Wow. Maybe. Okay. Right. Okay. And so do you, if you don't mind, like, you know, tell people a little about, about the aud auditioning process, because I have so many people always asking me these questions, like, what, what happens? Like, well, how do you select, you get those 200 people, or you've limited it to whatever, to 100 people. And then uh, when you're listening to people's demos, what are you looking for? What are you listening for? So that, uh, so our viewers can sort of get an idea of like, what, what's important to a casting director and a professional like yourself with lots of experience. Like, what are you hearing that say, for example, the average person doesn't hear, what do you listen for or hear that they don't usually hear? Um, so the first, to answer the first question, um, I, I can get up to anywhere, 500 so people, as casting directors can get up to anywhere to 500 auditions. Wow. Usually we try and limit it to a hundred or 200. Yeah. But it's it's very tedious to sit and listen to them. So yeah. even, you know, and sometimes we just go to our favorite agencies and say, send me your send me your best eight people for this role, or send me your best six people for this role, yeah. or you know, or or often you know, if you know people are talented and you think of somebody for a role, you'll request them and say, I request an audition from this person, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I get them, um, I, you know, I listen to them and we don't always listen to the whole thing we really listen to the first the first bit and right. if the first bit sounds promising then i'll keep listening keep listening but if the first bit seems sounds totally off you know the first 10 15 seconds then i'll be like that's not it or if i know that maybe they've done two takes i might go oh that's not it and then you know, go forward a little bit and see if their second take was anything that's interesting or compelling. And if it's not, then I just, you know, I move them over to a, you know, a no thank you file, you know? 
Okay. Like, you know, nah, a nah file. Um, nah. Okay. Um, and then if there's something that's kind of like, kind of like, huh, this could really be good. This is yeah. pretty, this is, if it's, there's something that interests me, yeah. um, I move it into a maybe file. And then if there's something that it's like, oh my God, this person is a definite contender, I yeah. move it into the contender file. Okay. And that way, like, and that way I'll just go back and I'll mostly pick all my picks from the contender files. But if they're not enough in there, then I'll start look, picking through my maybe file. Okay. Um, and, and what I'm looking for when I'm casting um, is somebody who makes me feel something. Okay. Good. A lot of people think that voiceover is doing a voice. Right. And to me, it's not, to me, voiceover is actually literally embodying a character and it happens to come through your voice. Okay. Um, so for example, um, a character I do for Persona, mm -hmm. um, the Persona games, her name is Nanako and she's a very popular character and she's a little girl with little pigtails and she's very endearing and I've been very lucky to voice her. Um, but she basically has a very high pitched voice, right. a little girl's voice. So she has a high pitched voice. So yeah. she talks with his voice. But yeah. the thing is, if I just keep on talking with his voice and I just keep on talking with his voice and I'm doing a voice and people say, oh, you have a good voice for anime. And I just keep doing this voice. Pretty soon it's going to get monotonous. And it's also you're just going to want to slap me and you're not going to want to listen to the voice anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if I can dive into the little girl in my soul or the little girl inside of me, the little Nanako inside of me and bring her to life and make people feel something. Yeah. So yeah. let me take that voice and bring her to life. So yeah, so hi, Raj. Oh, I'm Nanako and I'm really, really happy to be there. Oh, you're making me shy. Anyway, I'm really happy to be here. And I really, really like my big bro. And we like to go to Juness because every day is great. At your genus. And see, it's just not it's not perfect, but it's it's really alive. Right? Fantastic. Okay, let's give her a big clap for that one, guys. That's <laughs> so, but like like I watched you, that made you grin from ear to yeah. ear, right? <laughs> totally, yeah. And, and it's like we want to make people feel things. We wanna we yeah. wanna make ourselves vulnerable. We wanna, you know, if if we're an evil character, we wanna dive into that creepy evil part of ourselves, mm -hmm. you know not just do an evil voice, <laughs> you know? But like, we wanna like get into the essence of creepiness or, you know, or we wanna be playful and laugh and have fun ourselves so that people will. Yeah. And so what I'm listening for when I'm listening to an audition is not that people have a good character voice and that they're reading all the right words. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking for, I'm looking to be able to close my eyes and like, see them you know see them riding a horse in the west or see them you know fighting a dragon and <clears throat> not just hearing like ho ho ha ha i'm fighting a dragon but <laughs> right ah, 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 fighting a dragon ah, you know so that they really our job as actors is to is to like a kid, like kids who go into their backyard and they're holding onto a stick and that stick is a sword and they have a trash can lid and that trash can lid is their armor and they believe it. Yeah. And our job as actors is to dive into this imaginary world mm -hmm. and have it come to life for ourselves so that it comes to life for other people. So it's like, if the, if the directions, you know, We'll say the slug lines will say, you know, they, they embarrassed, you mm -hmm. know, some voice actors won't like make a voice that sounds embarrassed, but yeah. the people I tend to book are the people who actually are feeling embarrassed as they say it. And it just comes out embarrassed, but they're not trying to sound embarrassed. You know, mm -hmm. the people who, you know, don't try and sound jealous, but actually like or feel, allow themselves to feel jealous or mm -hmm. the people who, you know, um, are not just sounding angry, mm -hmm. but like allow that anger to well up in the pit of their stomach and have those lines tumble out being angry. So I'm, you know, I'm not looking for word perfect. I'm not looking for, you know, as a matter of fact, I prefer like throw the, 
you know, punctuation out the window, mm-hmm. you know, make a comma, a period, you know, make a question mark, a period, make, you know, take a long pause where there is none, live, let it breathe. A lot of people think that um, when they're reading an audition or when they're voice acting, that they, if they have to say the next word, the next word, the next word, period, the next word, the next word. But, yeah. you know, acting, voice acting is a lot like music in that way. Yeah, I where totally- we need our rests and our quarter rests. So yeah. I might say something and then say the next thing. <laughs> and really, really that's, say that's, something that's, that's really, really, really important, but take a moment yeah. to let that settle. Yeah, yeah. And then say, oh my gosh, I hope I didn't overstep my bounds. You know, and then, you know, what I just did is like, it was one thing that was very da da da. Then I took a minute and I felt bad about it. And all of a sudden my voice got smaller and quieter and sort of, you know, the timing changed, everything changed like music does. Yeah. You know, um, and voice acting as any art should have that sort of natural flow that comes from the inside. So I think I answered some of your questions about yeah, what we're, the they're looking for, we're looking for in auditions. Yeah, 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 it's fantastic. And so how, I mean, how, do, well, like, and, and it's, a, it's a big question, but how do you get that inner voice, that authenticity into your voice when you're doing auditions? Because I, I know a lot of people are, are struggling with with finding their the voice that they need. They they can they they have a voice, but they don't know how to find that the the feeling that you're trying to you're talking about. How you to project to go there, You have to go into your humanity. Okay, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. How and and you have to be. You have to dive into yourself as opposed to outside yourself. Mm-hmm. And and like, you know, and and that's why I always tell people who want to get into the voiceover industry, take acting classes. Because yeah. you learn things like, you know, to use your imagination, well, you know, what if, what if I had a big dragon in front of me and I was terrified? You know, so I'm not gonna be like, you know, oh, I'm gonna sound like there's a big dragon in front of me and I'm terrified. Ha ah, I'm so scared, ha ah, ha, right? Mm-hmm. As opposed to like, so, okay, so I'll, I'll try and do it right now. Please don't, please don't hurt me, Mr. Dragon. Oh my God, you just smiled at me, didn't you? Oh, oh he's putting his nose down to me. <laughs> um, Mr. Dragon, can I, be- ah! you know, so you, it's like you become a kid again. And you go, you, I mean, I don't know, but you become a kid again and you just, you play. And you that's, just and pulled that's, me right into that. Wow, so, okay. And and like I, my body got involved. Yeah. Because yeah. it did, you know. Yeah. Um, and you, it's like you become, a, and that's why people love voiceover because they get to be a kid again. But then they get so caught up in doing it right, or sounding right. And and if you if we really go there, mm-hmm. you know, like if I'm doing an old lady's voice, you know, so yeah, technically. An old lady is gravelly and in here and all those things, right? But then mm-hmm. what if I thought, okay, I'm an old lady. What that means, I've lived a long time and my body is tired. Yeah. So I've lived a long time and I'm going to speak slower. <laughs> now, if I'm a silly old lady, then maybe I, oh, I just like to please people. And no, oh, hello, would you, would you like that drink? And, you know, yeah. uh, but, you know, or if I'm an evil old lady, then I add that to it. You know, and then that bite on the evil. So it's, it's a lot of, you know, take theater classes, take acting classes. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I think, one of the best things to study for voiceover is Shakespeare. Oh. Because Shakespeare really uses words. Yeah, right. You know, right. Yeah. you know, speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue, but do not mouth it as some of our players do, as I would have leafed the town crier spoke my, you know. And, and when you study Shakespeare, you get to play with the sounds and the words. Mm-hmm. And anime and animation and video games, we can use the words, you know, right. a lot, a lot more 
than just, you know, a straight on camera thing. Right. Um, I, I think the that theater is great for, for voiceover. And so, I mean, that, and that's a, sorry to cut you off that. Uh, though, like some, uh, some um, young actors are, uh, kind of feel that the more voices, that the weirder the voices they've got, the more unique voices they have, that's what makes a great voice actor. And, but no, right? So what, what do you say to that? I mean, having multiple I mean, I having, voices. Mm -hmm. Having a carpet bag full of crazy, wonderful, unique voices is wonderful because right. you'll go in for a session and they'll be like, oh, you know, we have a funny looking toad here. Do you think you could voice them? And you can go, oh my God, that voice I do for the, you know, that felt like a troll mm -hmm. might actually work for the frog. You know, that voice that I have in my mind that's a troll voice might actually work for a frog. You know, or if, you know, you can do tons of accents, then that's going to come in handy. Right. You know, on like games like uh, World of Warcraft or Hearthstone, mm -hmm. you know, they're constantly, I, I go in for a session and they're constantly, you know, throwing, um, throwing dialects at me. Oh, Karen, you know, this, give this one a Scottish dialect. Oh, okay. Oh, Karen, you know, give this one a, a British dialect. Oh, Karen, this okay. one kind of like New York cab driver, this one more mm -hmm. Cockney, you know, and so it's really good to be able to have all of those possibilities because then you're ready for that. Or when you have an audition and you, it says in the breakdown, you know, this character is, you know, from, you know, uh, the, you know, Eastern European. Right. And you can go, oh, I'll lean towards my Russian accent or I'll go a little bit Russian Polish or, you know, this character is a vampire. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's really, it's really, really helpful to have, like I said, like a carpet bag full of accents and voices, but you need to first and foremost, be able to go there with that voice. Otherwise right. you're just doing a voice and what will happen is you'll go, you'll never get out of the maybe pile. Right. Because right. there'll always be somebody who does the voice and makes people feel things. Oh, God. That does is the voice who does the voice and actually goes has the courage mm -hmm. to go mm -hmm. there to, and the vulnerability to like really go there themselves. That is so profound. Feel. That's so profound. Yeah, that's such a great thing. Um, uh, yeah, no, that, that's a, that's an amazing piece of advice. I can think because so many people, you're right, just don't go, go there with you know in their in their heart and soul to that next space. So you're right, get, get out of the maybe pile. Oh my God. That's like, you. that's gotta be like, like a quote from Karen Strassman. Like, was it again, how to get out of the maybe pile? Is that what it? Yeah, that's, pretty, that's good. I yeah. Like yeah. I mean, when I, when I coach, you know, when I teach, I teach, well, I coach yeah. I teach classes with you guys and yeah, yeah. I teach animation with you guys or character yeah. acting with you guys. Mm -hmm. um, and when I do it privately and stuff, then that's what I'm helping. That's with each of my clients, whether it's in a class or group. I'm looking at what's going to take you out of the maybe pile. What's going to, yeah. what is it going to be that's going to make you make somebody feel something in such a way that they're like that one, that yeah. one, because they transported me. You want to make people feel things. You want to transport them, yeah. which means you have to go there yourself and not just do a, do a funny, quirky voice. Funny, quirky voice will only take you so far. Right. And then to make that transition, you said find your humanity, but how do you, how would you train yourself? So you, cause you can do it instantly for a lot of people. I mean, we don't have that experience that you've got and we need, uh, people need a little bit of time to ramp up to get to that voice, but how would you, how do you train yourself to like get to that, that special space? Cause you, like I said, you just do it instantly. You switch voices and characters instantly, but for those who are getting into voice acting, how do they, how, how would you suggest they sort of put themselves in the right frame of mind or, or, or train themselves to get there? Well, one thing again is just time spent. I mean, the reason why I've had been lucky enough to be successful is just because I've been doing this for so long. So I've, I've been able, I've made a lot of mistakes and I've fallen on my face a lot and yeah. I've done media go work a lot, which I've yeah. learned from, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I'd say like at, get into acting classes you know and there's so many acting classes on zoom right now you don't have to be living in a major city to be working with a major acting coach you know in los angeles new york anywhere you know it used to be like oh you know i live in you know kentucky and there's no good acting classes and now they're on zoom so you can get on 
into any acting class and just do a little research and find the one that fits. Right. And I'd say also, you know, hopefully before choosing a class, you can audit the class and see if it feels right. And I'd say to people to follow your intuition. If it just doesn't feel right, trust yeah. your intuition and look for other, another coach and find a coach that it's a fit, that right. makes it fun, that makes it encouraging. There's a lot of coaches out there that will make you feel <laughs> like, like crap. Oh, I did that yeah. oh, I did yeah. that bad. Oh, I did that bad. And you want a coach who's really going to, who will see you. Right. You want a coach who sees people and helps bring you out and helps yeah. you find your own journey in words, you know, yeah. and not like, no, no, no. You know, you don't want a coach who, who's that archetype. I, I know somebody just like that. And uh, oh. it's, uh, I, I've had the, I'm not, I've never gotten any names, but it was such a bad experience to, to work with someone who is so negative with everybody. You're so positive and you're so giving with your students and, and you're just exactly the opposite. And after seeing somebody do that, I'm like, I don't never want to put through students through that again. Yeah. Cause I think it, you're right. I think I feel it's demeaning for them, right? It's not, it's not helping them to be negative, correct? And, and I, I don't know what you also, think. You know? Also you get the best work out of people when they feel confident and encouraged and right. good. When they feel yeah. the permission to actually be themselves. And like yeah. as a director, that's my number one job is to make people like to make people feel right. great. Right. When they come to the booth, like my number one job is to make people feel great about their work. And right. so it's like that's great and I love this about it. Now, yeah. let's add this. And so the adding this, or now I'm going to give you an adjustment because that was great, but it was a little sad. And I want to, I want to give, I want to make it stronger read. You know, I want to make you more, um, more courageous in this moment, you know, but you, but if you say to somebody, it's just, if you say to somebody, um, okay, no, um, no, you were sad there. No, we don't know. Um, I want to make it courageous in this moment. Then the actor, cause we're actors, we're so sensitive, we're so sensitive. I'll be like, oh, oh, that was bad. Uh, okay, now I'm gonna be courageous. And my courageous isn't gonna come from, yeah. uh, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be criticizing myself because we're so sensitive actors. Yeah. Whereas if I say to somebody, oh my God, that was great, um, which I will mean. Yeah. Um, and now let's take what you just did. Um, I love the part about where you said this word, but I yeah. wanna take what you just did now and I want to make, I want to take away the sadness and I want to make them really strong. And then the actor's like, okay, cool. You know, and they're not like suddenly questioning themselves. Yeah. And the more, you know, and the, the more you like cut somebody down, the more they're just like, they're, they're disconnected from their creative essence and their creative core. So you want to find, uh, and I'm sure it's the same in music. Like when yeah. you're writing music or composing music, yeah. you know, you are probably at, your most creative and yeah. juiciest when you're connected to your creative core and feeling good about that and working with clients who aren't like, no, 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 but who are like, Ooh, okay. that's good. Place a little more of that or go and lean in the darker direction or, yeah. you know, yeah. lean more happy now, you know, it, it must be true. The same, the same yeah. thing, right? Yeah, to totally. I, I mean, I, I, um, it was interesting because like years ago it was like when I was first starting out when my, um, one of my uh, teachers in Japan, one of the guys, the producers I was working with, that he was, he said, like, musicians are not really writing music, we're antennas, and we're picking up things, and we're channeling things, and just like voice, I think most, most artists are channeling, yeah, yeah. He said, and so when, when people scream at you, how are you going to channel anything, because your, like, your, your antennas down. are you shutting down, yourself. right, you need to have the antennas up, and you need to be flowing, and you need to be channeling all these good vibes, and and that, that can't that. come when someone's screaming at you, you know? And yeah. So, yeah. So, 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 yeah. So I'd say like the, the first thing for people to do is really dive into acting classes because that's going to, yeah. that's going to give you the ability to be thrown roles and opportunities in class. And how do I find my way there? How do I find my way into anger? How do I find my way into, you know, and, and then the, and then it becomes like a dancer's muscle or even a musician's muscle, you know, the more time a dancer spends at the bar, the more flexible they get. Right. And the more like, you know, every day things are flown are thrown at me, you know, yeah. okay. You know, uh, be a frog with a low IQ. Okay. <laughs> you know, you know, be a frog with a low IQ with a lisp. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. And you know, I don't know, but like, 
but then I put go into myself like and people have often said to me oh you look so funny when you're voice acting and I'm like please because I just go there you know like if I'm doing a boy's voice I'm going to be different than a girl because I'm going into like what if I was a little boy so you know what if I was a little boy I mean what would that be like so yeah yeah. so I, I don't know uh you know yeah you know yeah Whereas what if I was 10 years old and, and, you know, and, you know, it's like finding that you want to find those sparks or you want to find like, you know, in my, in my uh, um, character acting classes with people, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, I, it's really fun to, well, what is it really like to be a queen and to feel that your kingdom is taking, a, is taken away from you and mm-hmm. you want to poison someone, right? you know, like, literally not just like what what happens on the inside of you what does that feel like and yeah. and it's it's an opportunity you know i mean when you really go those places it's super cathartic because you get to visit places that you know we That's don't usually get to visit and you know like i just i do i'm on tv right now in yeah. the on, on camera in the series called mayans mc it's um how do you spell that my can you uh, yeah m-a-y-a-n-s mayans mayans okay mc is in motorcycle club okay okay which is um it's a an offshoot of sons of anarchy that's so funny my uh, we were just working with kim coates oh sons of anarchy that's so weird oh yeah. that's so cool yeah okay that's so crazy okay that's in- good interesting coincidence okay yeah i mean i play and i play um a violent meth addict <clears throat> okay Matt. and like you look at me right now and there's like i don't look like i could play no. a meth addict at all <laughs> that does, that's not your vibe at all but and, and what was so cool about it, it was so cathartic because yeah. when i went on to set you know i i booked the role and i just went there i said you know yeah. what i'm gonna i'm gonna go into that violent angry mm-hmm. effed up part of myself and i'm just gonna we all have that we all have all of humanity in us you know, like as a musician, it's like you're just, you're tapping into the part that vibrates with the experience of what that is, you know? Right, right, right. right. And, and so I tapped into that in myself, you know, what, you know, what would it be like if I was, you know, so effed up and I had had a really wounded past and I was really angry and all I wanted to do was escape everything and do, you know, meth or anything else get into something crazy and so how did you did you prepare for this role like is there something that you do i know that you you, you're so talented every every role is different every role is different this role um i i talked to a bunch of friends who have been around meth addicts or have had that experience to Mm -hmm. understand what it felt like physiologically in the body and what the cravings are what it's like what the Mm -hmm. how the nervous system goes and you know, I did, I did a bunch of research, but ultimately when I did, you do the research, you have to vi- it's like a tuning fork, you know, right. you hear it on the outside and you have to find that vibration with it inside of yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like acting is very much like a tuning fork, mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, and, okay. and, and dialects are like that as well. I mean, I know I'm giving the dialect intro, intro to dialect workshop with you guys <laughs> this coming Saturday. And but learning dialects is, is mm-hmm. like I always tell people it's like you want to you want to hear feel your way into it. It's okay. not an intellectual thing like oh you know it's you it's like like with music you hear feel your way into it. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And you know any dialect mm-hmm. you know you're gonna you're going to fight like a tuning fork. You're going to tune yourself to that dialect. Right. The same thing of the same thing of an evil queen. You're going to, it's like a, you're going to tune yourself to what it feels like to, to mm-hmm. be powerful, but at right. the same time want mm-hmm. to kill. Right. You no. Know? And then, and then, you know, adjectives will get like, you know, maybe, and then maybe the breakdown says she's very dramatic. Oh, well, if she's very dramatic, then, you know, yeah. and then if they, and, or if it says, um, or if it says she's very sexy, mm-hmm. oh, well then, I'm a soft-spoken, passive, aggressive, evil queen. Mm. <laughs> 
come closer, you know? Oh, and so, and so it's like you want to, you take the suggestions from the breakdown and you have to have the balls and the courage to go there. You know? <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. As a kid, it, but, but if you're a kid playing in your backyard, it's not balls or courage. It's just fun. Yeah. No, I mean, I think it's almost like, do you, do you think it's more like, like going back to our childhood sort of state of mind? That, the, you know? I mean, that's like, is when you compose music that's, or play music, is it like that with you? Yeah, totally. I mean, it, it's the joy, it's the joyous thing is when, when you're having fun and you're enjoying something, you tend to do the best that when you let go. I mean, that's why I personally love being an artist because I feel like I can let go of things and I can just do what comes naturally like you as an actor I think that you're just a fantastic actor so you can just it's just natural for you and it's something that comes out I think we've trained ourselves as musicians and actors to let let it flow like let that whatever is out there that energy flow yeah. through us and yeah. flow into what we're doing and and it's a reason why we do what we do and I and I think that you that's so valuable what you're talking about how about being you know like channeling those things and letting go I feel like you know there's a I don't know if you read the Tao Te Ching before. It was always my favorite book when I was in college. Ugh. It was like, one you know, do as I'm doing. Books I haven't read yet. And oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, I, I, have to, I have to read that. That's it, the, one of the greatest passages is do without doing and be without being. And it's just, you know, every single day I remember it. I go like, because the more you try to hold on to something, it's like a slippery fish that just gets out of your hands. You're trying so hard to squeeze a slippery fish out of a river and it's never, you're never going to catch it um, that way. And I think about that all the time. And so it's one of my inspire, inspirational books is the Tao Te Ching, so. Whereas, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take where you're going and run with it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you swim like a slippery fish yourself, you'll probably get very close to the slippery fish. Yeah, that's so true. Inside them. That's, that could, that's probably another Taoist saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's somewhere there. It was, Be the slippery fish. Be the slippery fish. <laughs> Do, yeah, not, oh, do not grasp the slippery do not be grasp the slippery fish. fish be the slippery fish oh my god that's a great name for a production company the slippery fish right be yeah. the slippery fish uh, you know that's really true you know you can't yeah it's like it's the talking like, head song slippery people which i love yeah yeah oh yeah i love the talking heads you know i met um the member the, some of them live here you know they live in mill valley really? um yeah Ooh, which ones uh, uh the keyboard player jerry harrison lives in in mill valley so i've run into him several times and and uh uh so i'm not I, yeah but anyway th those guys are around here and it's like you know listen to talking heads and going i hear the talking heads and go like oh my god that still makes sense today you know it's just never it's so timeless you know david burns lyrics are so timeless. They actually never stop making sense yeah <laughs> There you go. <laughs> right. Exactly. Never stop making sense. You know, it's, uh, yeah, I was young people need to listen to talking heads again. Yeah. They need to listen to all these profound people out there. I, you know, it's like, I had the pleasure of working with um, Tom Waits the past few days. Right. No. And, yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. So it was cool. I, I guess I can say that I can't say anything else, but it's cool. You know, it's, it was a really interesting, fun experience with him. And, um, and so it's been cool like working with different people because we the studio is kind of like boutique and so we have interesting people coming by all the time for different projects and and um yeah we get these you know interesting people like all the time it's always somebody you know, cool like yourself right it was cool interesting people i'm not so. as cool as tom waits <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I can't say anything yet, but we can. We'll talk about it eventually when when it comes out. But uh, it's been, you know, interesting that, uh, you know, he's one of those guys like a lot of like a lot of people who learn to like channel that, you know, something, something, you know what I mean? Like like Leonard Cohen, who've always grown up loving too. You know, oh. it's the vo voice. It's the voice that yeah. channels something. You know, and it's, it's you know, and it's it's a. Uh... Yeah, and they but they take you places. They're like they go yeah. through a portal. Yeah. They, oh yeah, totally. You know, drop they just drop in somewhere. <clears throat> they just, I'm, you know. And right? and they create access for us to drop into these places that we just would never access in our everyday life. You're so true. They just you're right. It's you're right. It's like a black hole in space. <gasps> They just, you just drop into another universe and you're like, okay, whoa, where, where are we now? It's like, how did that happen? Just suddenly 
they pull you into another another place, you know, that you you weren't ready for. And I think that's I think what most great artists do. And I don't think there's, I don't know, maybe you can tell me, but I don't know what differentiates people. Some people just seem to resonate with a lot of different people. And even though other people are just as great, I don't know what why is it is it timing? I mean, this and that brings me to a really good point because a lot of voice actors are, are are trying to become famous, but I keep telling them it's not about becoming famous. So if you want to become famous, then I don't know. I just that it's possible, but I wouldn't advise getting into any of this to be famous, like to be a musician or a voice actor. What do you have to say to that? I'd love to hear. Well, I, I, oh my gosh, I so agree because yeah, um, if. <sighs> It's very dangerous to try to become famous because then you're trying to please people and then you're not you're not being wild and raw. Yeah. And I think, you know, and I, I and I have totally I think I would have a much more interesting career um, if I hadn't spent so many years trying to be good. You know, is that right? Does that sound good? Does that sound okay? What do you mean? For can you give us like be more specific? Does that be, sound okay? What do you mean? Sound, oh, okay? I see. <laughs> is that good? Is that what you want? Instead of just that, being yeah. instead of like, you know, this is my sexy queen. You know, not like okay, I did it. Is that good? You know, and this like, yeah. do people like it? Do people like me? You know, and as soon as you fall into that, you. <sighs> Yeah. You step out of the shoes or the bare feet of an artist, you know? Oh my God, that's so good. You've had so many, you said so many profound things in the past hour. I'm just like, oh my God. okay, luckily we're recording all of this because there's so many great nuggets. In it. But you're right, it's, it's a difference between Violetta Davis. Remember, I saw, I'm a Mo Black Bottom. Oh my God. And like, just, you know, it's me. This is what I'm going to do. Take it or leave it kind of deal, you're right. Uh, or as opposed to, you know, but you know, it's hard. It's a hard thing because you you got to make a living, you know. And th there's that, you know. I, I mean, because I, I write, you know, work for hire. I, so I, you know, I get contracted to write music. I'm working on a mobile game right now. Those kinds of things, you know. So you have to take direction. So and that gives, brings me to a great question for you: Where is the balancing act between taking your shoes off and being that artist with barefoot artists running around doing your thing? and taking direction and being a working actor. Cause man, oh man, I think that's so hard to find that balance. So what do you direction, think? Direction is great because direction is, is the size of your canvas. Like, okay, I yeah. want you to do this, but the canvas is this size. Okay, good. Now I know what I have to work with. It's your materials. It's like, yeah. it's like, um, it's like tennis. So um, here's a racket, here's a ball, you know, just hit it around. No. Here's a racket, here's a ball. Now there's a net. Yeah. So the direction is the ball has to go over the net and it can't go outside the white lines. Yeah. And then as a tennis player, you get creative because you know what your goals are. And then you can really play a game. Whereas uh, here's a racket, here's a ball. Oh, okay. You know, it's the same thing with you. It's like, you know, if somebody just goes, oh, compose me some music. Yeah. You're like, you know, directions are yeah. you know directions are a medium here is some acrylic or here's a watercolor i want you to paint me um a flamingo yeah okay let me then now it's not just like here's some watercolor and a, a wall paint something which i could do but it's like okay no let me do my flamingo you know and, 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 and it's, you know, the same thing for composing, like here's yeah. a video game, you know, we want it to get really rough and tumble here. We want it kind of gently, you know, whatever. And then yeah. you're like, got it. And then you can channel, you can tap into you and do that. So again, it's like, we want, direction shouldn't be like um, pleasing people. Like, is my flamingo good enough? But it should be like, I was thinking of this for a flamingo. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of this for a flamingo voice. What do you think? Yeah. Um, I like it, but actually it would be really cute because this flamingo wears a tutu. I didn't know that. Yeah. Could you make her, <laughs> could you give her a French accent as a a little, a delicate prima 
ballerina flamingo in a tutu. Yeah. Oh, sh- oh, so but no, now I am the flamingo doing yeah. the dance. How do you like this? Right. Oh, that's good. Um, can you make her uh, more like a teenager? Oh, now I am the flamingo and I am a prima baller, ballerina, you know. And so it's like the direction is more like, it's not like trying to do it right. It's it's creative medium. Like, oh, can you add some red to that? Ooh, where would the red go? You know, oh, Raj, you know, God, it would be really cool to have a little bit of flute in there. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. Have you heard the French term ennui? Yes. Ennui? Yeah, yeah, right. And, and it was, I was thinking about that today. I was, I was listening to NPR and it was like- Literally translating as boredom yeah. or sad boredom. <laughs> right, or languishing. I mean, and now people, yeah, yeah. It's this whole like, ugh, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> and I was going like, how do I explain that? You got it bored. I guess it's boredom, but I was trying to go, how do I translate that into, into English, right? And I guess it's a, it translates boredom and languishing, which is yeah. which is something languishing that, boredom. Yeah, languishing. Oh, you know, I'm so privileged. I'll just language languish right now. Language language right now. You know, in, in all my privilege. Uh, it was interesting because um, uh, they're saying that a lot of young people don't know how to channel their emotions because they're constantly behind a screen, and they're not interacting with people. So they end up with ennui, kind of. You know, oh. Um, what was me and because our generation would we interact we just you sit down you want to meet somebody I'd have to call them on their f- landline meet them at a coffee shop and say let's what's up let's talk and have a cup of coffee and face to face there was no email there was when I grew up there's no cell phones no email yeah. I mean you got together with people and you you had it out you broke up with somebody <laughs> you went to see them you went to see them you had to face them probably in your car, right? And then a big crying thing going on and, you know, screaming and stuff like that. But nowadays it's like a text. Hey, see you later, we're done. You know, or worse on social media, DM on social media. So we have that, you know, in, you know, the, our generation has this more like interpersonal, you know, activity and we know how to talk to people and stuff. But young, what would you say to young people? I know a lot of young voice actors, especially ones are gonna hear this or, like how do I channel those things? I mean, it sounds like it sounds logical to us, but where do the, where are they going to get that from? Any any suggestions for them to to pull that up? And, you know, passion and imagination. If, yeah. If this was me, and if this was me, and I was, you know, what? Let me remember what it was like to be twelve years old and to be excited to be talking to somebody. Let me remember, let me, if I, you know, if I was a, from France and a prima, mm. and a prima ballet, ballet flamingo, yeah. and I thought I was all wonderful, like mm-hmm. already I'm talking, I'm talking myself into it. And I thought I was all wonderful and my body is moving with me. You know, yeah. it's, it's imagination. Like you do as a child, go back into playing house as a child you know yeah yeah yeah. um and 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 and, and empathy what would it feel like if but not like intellectually well it would feel like this but like let me drop into my into my heart like you know oh my gosh i would be so embarrassed i would be hurt oh okay now i'm afraid to say anything because you know it's it's a lot of of that you know and it's and i think People feel it when they watch anime, like when we take them places and people will write to me, oh my gosh, when Nanako had that moment or oh my gosh, when this character had that moment, I was so sad or she just made me laugh so much. And so we have that empathy when we are drawn into those worlds. Right. And so people have it. And then it's just a question of, of being able to self-generate it. Right. Yeah, no, I, oh wait, that's a great way. Another great nugget, self-generate, self-generate the emotions, right? Mm. Cool. Okay, well, um, any tips? And oh, actually, before I get to that, um, what are you working on now? Anything you can talk about that we can we can tell everybody about? Um, most everything is NDA, um, but Mayan's MC just came out. You can see me on TV. 
Okay, great. What channel is that going to be on? Uh, it's on FX and Hulu. Okay, fantastic. All right. Uh, and I'm in about, I have a, it's a smaller role, but it was just great to work during COVID and it was great to be able to be a meth addict. My whole body is all tatted up. <laughs> um, the you got all the tats? Oh man. I, I can't imagine you. I was carrying like a weapon in my hand, like a gun or a crowbar. <laughs> oh my God. Like that's, uh, I can't, I can't even imagine that, but I can't wait to see it. Okay. Mayans, um, Mayans MC, MC. On, on FX and Hulu and? Um, and, uh, I mean, I think people can go on to IMDb and see what's been announced in terms of, um, I, let's see, they can see me in this third season of Bosch. They can see me in the first season of Creep Show. Oh yes, Creep Show. You were talking about that before. Awesome. I yeah. love Creep Show. It, and so Creep this Creep Show is a reboot of the 80s Creep yeah. Show, right? Yeah, it's wonderful. And I'm in I'm in one of one of the shows um, about zombies. It's all oh, fabulous. love it, love it. Um and uh, I'm in season two of Preacher and I play oh, part of the ambiguous what? evil German scientist. I've been started watching Preacher. Okay, great. We're, okay, all right, cool. All right, I'll look for you. Season. Okay, yeah. fantastic, fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Um, and then, um, you know, the the stuff that I'm sort of a regular in, like a lot of Hearthstone, a lot of World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the Spider-Man game. Okay, cool. Um, let's see what else. Monster Hunter. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in Cells at Work, the anime Cells at Work. I play the narrator of all the seasons. Oh, nice. Hunter x Hunter. I play. Oh, my daughter's going to freak out. Hunter x Hunter. She's into Hunter x Hunter right now. Okay, great. A very creepy character in Hunter x Hunter. Nice. A very creepy character in Berserk. Nice. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm directing a series right now called Gus the Itsy Bitsy Knight, and I'm directing it for Disney, but you won't see me in it. Um, that, okay. that'll be that'll be on sometime next year. Um, Congratulations, yeah. you're doing great as usual. Thanks, yeah, yeah. And uh, any anything else we should be keeping on? That's a lot to digest. Oh, to and, oh and, and for those Resident Evil fans, I have a I play Annette, um, Annette, uh, what's her name? the scientist in Resident Evil. I did the motion capture for that and everything. And that's been, it's wonderful. And Resident Evil fans just love, I, I did yeah. the remake and some other Resident Evils and that's really fun for people. Great. And then all, you know, and then everybody knows it's like old stuff, Poison yeah. and Melina and Katana from Mortal Kombat and Colin nice. from Code Geass. Nice. Uh, Persona and Bleach and Soyphone and yeah. I guess. Yeah. So much, so much great stuff out there. Um, and then, and then another thing that I'll be doing is this coming Saturday, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be giving a workshop for you guys. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm going to be actually applying everything that we've been talking about and I'm going to coach people. I'm going to teach people how to get really, really proficient at accents. It's going to be a night. It's huge chock full of information Okay. Uh, four hour day um okay. and i'm gonna be basically anybody who has any interest in accents whatever level you are at i'm gonna help you go to the next level so okay. if you're beginning i'm gonna give you all the information you need to get to the next level if you're really good at accents but you want to get better and you want to get um more uh, you know just more tips and tools um mm -hmm. and then we'll pick one accent together that the group agrees on and we'll we'll work it together but I'm going to give so many tips and tools okay. for how to approach accents and dialects. Everybody, everybody who always has ever worked with me, well, not everybody, but most people who work with me, I always get the feedback at the end of the class. They love you. They people. love you, Karen. Aww. Well, they I don't know about that, but, but yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> but they do tell me that all of the information that I share makes accents and dialects more accessible than they ever imagined, more yeah. easy and more fun. And they feel more empowered doing them. And they feel like dialects are much more at their reach and that they can be even better at them than they thought they were. And that's kind of my, always my goal for people. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm, 
I, I, I coach the way I would want to be coached and I want to make things really accessible and easy and fun. And because I've been doing it for so long, I've just developed ways to make things very, very accessible to people. So anybody who's interested in, in that, um, you will get a lot out of it. You will come out of the workshop feeling that you can really do accents and you can literally do almost any accent. I mean, you won't be able to be like magically doing every accent when you come out of the workshop, but you'll be able to be like, wow, I have access to any accent I want to focus on right now because I'm, I help people take accents apart and put them together and figure out um, you know, what parts of the instrument they're mm -hmm. in and how they function and, and people who are good at accents, I always get the feedback from them. Oh my gosh, I learned even more. I can be even better and even more consistent at it than I have before. So I'll, I'll give you guys, I'll get everybody information to work with everybody at their own level. Um, right. Well, I've got a Scottish accent sorry. now, Karen, after talking to you. <laughs> what? I said not, nothing. <laughs> I was joking. I've got a Scottish accent now for talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's fantastic. And then this is super valuable for their careers as well, right? To develop yeah. these accents and be able oh, to. Yeah. Be I mean, it's it's yeah. sort of, at this point, it's sort of a necessity to be able, if you want to be a <clears throat> artist, it's, right. it, it's a necessity to be able to have um, access to accents. Right. Um, I mean, you don't have to, but it just, gives you a possibility of a lot more work. And as everybody knows, voiceover is a numbers game. Yep. And, um, and there's yep. so much work that involves accents, video games, you know, more than half of them demand accents, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. animation, everything. Um, it's just, it's, they're so, they're so in demand. So if you can do an accent, it puts you heads and tails ahead of other people who can't. Yeah. Fantastic. Karen, Thank you so much for your time. You're awesome as usual. Thank you for everything. Great tips for everybody. Uh, great advice. And again, this Saturday from 11 to 4. Yeah. Was it 11, 11 to 4? And how do they tell them how they sign up? Uh, we're going to send a link out to everybody. Austin's going to send a link to everybody so they can sign up for the workshop. Uh, and um, everybody that, that's here on, online will we'll get a, a link and we'll be, we'll be posting this on Facebook and Instagram, this, everything's being recorded. So we post it everywhere. Yeah. So, yeah. And then we'll share it with you to share with other people too, so they can have, they can see the interview and they can, they can, um, you know, um, learn from this and learn what to expect from the class and everything as well. Right. Okay. Yeah. And my, and my, um, my Instagram is at Karen Strassman. Um, I tend to spend of all the social medias, I tend to spend more time on Instagram, but I also have a Facebook fan, a Facebook fan page, which um, I post on all the time, every day as well. Well, every other day. Um, and that's Karen Strassman fan page. And my Twitter is at Karen Strassman. And I try and post across the board. And also if people tag me and stuff, I try and I try and repost it. Like, so if people have fan art, I always try and repost it. Right. Um, and I answer as many questions as I can. Sometimes I get really busy and I get behind um, on social media, but I try and do my best and I, I'm happy to answer questions or Great. something like that. Great, Karen. Thanks again for everything. We really appreciate you taking That's time. It's such stuff. a pleasure. I just yeah, so cool to, like, feel like, you know, we just, we just vibe together. We, we, hook, up, <laughs> we hook up in the cloud. I, you know, know. Just, like, vibe. I miss having you here in the studio. We'll have oh. you back here soon. I mean, honestly, I think soon we'll be able to have people back in the studio. I would love to have you back up here again so I can cook for everybody and host everybody and have people live here in the studio again. I love it when you- Yeah, I'm, I, yeah it's, it's, been, um, it's been fun, but lonely, you know, because it's like Zoom. So I'm kind of looking forward to people coming back to the studio again. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. All right, well, thanks again for everything. A big thanks to Karen, a big silent clap. All these people are clapping in the background. The, 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 say the, the thing about the uh, Di Ching. Be, don't, what, oh, what those be, words? oh uh, um, what did I say again? Which one is it again? Um, be the change you want to see is one. Do without doing and be without being. Yeah. Do without doing and be without being. Yeah, it's super important, right? Do without doing and be without being. Uh, I think it's just like, you know, it's just like, you know, don't try to grab the slippery fish out of the water. <laughs> like you hit it right on the head, be the slippery fish. Be the slippery and then, fish. Yeah, be that's, the slippery our, fish. that's our ending note, right? Be, <laughs> be, be the, the slippery, slippery fish. fish. Yeah, I love that. 
<laughs> that is so good. Oh my God, Karen, I got so much good stuff today. It was so amazing to talk to you. Yeah. Thanks for everything. Okay. Take care. All right. We'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.